Good afternoon. Uh, this is the Transportation Advisory Committee of Dr. Cog, and my name's Kent Mormon. I'm the chair. Um, as a reminder for agenda item questions and comments, please use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak. Once it's your turn, staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Please make sure you also are also unmuted on your end. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the question box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to agenda items. At this time, um, Melinda, would you list all the attendees? And if for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Melinda at mstevens at drcog.org so she can add your name to the record. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, it looks like we have Aaron Busto, Amanda Brimmer, Andrea LaRue, Ben Pierce, Brad Calvert, Carson Pre <coughs> Priest, Chris Chauvin, Chris Hudson, Chris Quinn, David Gaspers, David Kretzinger, Don Slutter, <clears throat> Deborah Basket, Eileen Yazzi, Evan Brigham, Flo Raitano, Gerardo Martinez, James Eusen, Jean Sanson, Jennifer Carpenter, Jessica Micklebus, John Cotton, Jordan Rudell, Josie Hadley, Julie George, Karen Schneiders, Kelly Keaton, Kenneth Johnstone, Ken, Kevin Ash, Lawrence Talong, Lisa Nguyen, Matt Callison, Marissa Gon, uh, Megan Shea, Melanie Chiquette, Sangu Lee, Scott McCary, Steve Durian, Alvin Bedal Sanchez, Campbell Kennedy, Jacob Rieger, Lisa Hood, Melinda Stevens, Robert Spots, Ron Papstorch, Steve Cook, and Todd Cottrell. Thank you. Um, I believe, uh, Ron, you had an introduction you wanted to make today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, an announcement and an introduction. So, um, uh, Melinda Stevens, who has been the Division Assistant for um, the Transportation Planning and Operations Division at Dr. Cog since, oh, what? Uh, September August. Of this, August of last year. Thank you, Melinda, constantly bailing me out. Um, <laughs> has has recently been promoted at Dr. Cog. She's now the executive assistant. Um, Doug Rex stole her away from us, um, but we're really happy she's staying in the Dr. Cog family. Um, so that left us a vacancy in the division assistant. So I'd like to take the opportunity this afternoon to introduce our new division assistant, Cam Kennedy. Uh, Cam is on the line today assisting, um, assisting Melinda, uh, kind of getting familiar with our processes. Cam has actually been with Dr. Cog for a little over a year now, Cam. Yep. 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 And manning our front desk. So um, an internal um, uh, change for Cam, but we're really happy to have him join have him have him joining us here at TPO. So from this point forward, you all will um, see Cam helping us manage these virtual meetings while they um, continue. And once we're back to having in-person meetings, hopefully someday. Uh, you all will meet Cam in person. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. Um, at this, at this time, um, is there any public comment? All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if you have public comment and are logged in via computer, please raise your virtual hand, and we'll call on you. Uh, I'll start. If there's anyone who has called into the meeting on the phones, uh, please hit star six now to unmute yourself uh, for public comment. So we'll start with the phones. If there's anyone, please speak up now. And you have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up your uh, wrap up and your line will be muted. Correct, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that reminder. Um, so I'm not hearing anyone speak up on the phone. So now I'll look to the computers to see if there are any virtual hands raised. Uh, it looks like uh, we do have uh, a comment from Art Griffith. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute him and see if this is actual uh, public comment. Art, go ahead. I just had one question. It says I've joined this um, TAC meeting as listen only. So is that normal? Um, to be quite honest, I don't know why that would come up. But as long as you, I mean, it sounds like you can participate. And are you able to hear and view everything that we're projecting right now? Yeah, and I can see the hand. So I'll just use that. Okay, great. Awesome, thanks Art. Okay, 
Uh, and with that, I don't see any other hands raised for public comment, Mr. Chair. All right. Um, we have um, the TAC uh, meeting summary before you. Are there any changes or corrections to those? Okay, I'll look to see if there are any hands. Okay, uh, I do not see any hands raised. All right. Um, at this time, uh, um, we don't have any action items. Uh, we do have informational briefings. And so uh, Todd Cottrell will have the first one and it's a briefing on the 2020, 2023 Transportation Improvement Program white paper and its attachment be in your package. Todd. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So before I dig in and uh, just like to talk about the recommendations as laid out in the white paper, I wanted to bring this back and talk about pretty much how we got here. So in every tip cycle where a call for projects takes place, uh, Dr. Cog's staff always conducts some sort of review of how the previous process went. In the past, this was you know, usually conducted through discussions with the TAC and the board, and the outcomes and suggestions you know, help guide staff and others involved in the process during the development of the next TIP policy document. But however, since the, the, the 2023 TIP policy was organized as such a complete turnaround from previous cycles, a different process ensued during this TIP development process. First off, uh, two white papers were developed and approved by our board in early uh, 2016 and early 2017. Uh, and these eventually guided the dual model process that we have today. As part of the second white paper development, again in early 2017, um, Dr. Cog asked our federal partners to weigh in uh, just to make sure that all the federal requirements were being met. Um, one of those requirements as outlined in their response was to simply evaluate the dual model concept and make any appropriate re revisions. Um, the white paper that you see before you today is the result of those requirements um, to review the process and hence the expanded post-tip review process. So the white paper um, that is attached to the memo is organized into three distinct sections. Uh, first is the introduction and purpose, um, which really basically contains most of the information I just covered. Um, the second is the dual model process overview. Um, this section is a generalized overview of the process and highlights the newly introduced elements of the TIP process, uh, mainly, say, the transportation forums, the regional and sub-regional selection process, um, the TIP focus areas, and the other substantial changes, such as the application and scoring method, um, the removal of, of submitting for only certain project types by applicants. Uh, and finally, the third section is the post-TIP post adoption analysis and future discussion topics. So this is where I really wanted to concentrate kind of our, the remainder of our discussions today. So as Dr. Cog was beginning to develop the white paper, uh, a CU Denver School of Public Affairs graduate student reached out um, to Dr. Cog's staff inquiring ways to work in partnership to complete his capstone project and then also assist Dr. Cog in reviewing the TIP process. So after discussions back and forth, an agreed to process would include things such as a survey, um, gathering input and comments from both technical, uh, the, the technical committees and forums, one-on-one um, -on -one stakeholder interviews as necessary, and of course, ending with the development of the white paper uh, on the outcome. Uh, these steps allowed Dr. Cog's staff and, both, and the graduate student to both achieve their end results um, with the added benefit of allowing the capstone project to provide sort of those additional technical details into the history of the TIP process uh, and compare those TIP, those um, previous process outcomes to the new uh, dual model process. Um, the, the student's capstone paper is included in a, um, Appendix A of the white paper if you're interested in, in diving in, into more of the details. So now we get into sort of the discussion topic, topics that's outlined in the white paper and these are essentially organized into two categories. Um, the first is high-level questions and topics that, topics that staff believe should be the focus of discussions for the next TIP policy document and the call for projects for the 24 through 27 TIP. 
And secondly, minor and you know, more technical improvements to the process. Uh, we be anticipate beginning these discussions sometime next summer. Um, it's also important to note that the topics listed in the white paper are not so all-encompassing, but just for your view, and of course, the ones that rose to the top. So the first, uh, the first topic was re in regards to the regional share, uh, and the regional share intent, regional share definition, of course, eligibility. Throughout the TIP development process and continuing into the regional share calls for projects process, uh, you know, this seemed to be where most of the comments and discussions came from. Um, the overall intent of the regional share throughout the process was that a clear definition of eligible projects would keep the number of those regional share applications reasonable and assure that uh, you know, the scarce and rather low amount of the regional funds went to the highest priority projects with the greatest benefit to the region. In terms of the regional share definition, um, I think we can all agree that most of us knew what a regional project was, but we really had a difficult time describing what it was. In all reality, it was sort of, you know it when you see it. Um, the white paper provides several regional share discussion topics that could be included. You know, and these include such as, you know, should regional share projects be directly recommended by the county forums, um, or should they be uh, provided directly through the MPO committee process? Should regional share funds, you know, go directly to only one or a few regional projects or programs to make the most of the funds available to the region and really try to you know move the needle on one of these metrovision transportation related objectives another question simply was you know should the regional share be eliminated so i think there's a lot of discussion to be had uh, when we eventually get to that to those discussions next summer uh, the, the second topic uh, is the percentage split between the regional and the sub-regional share. So if you recall, the, the current split is 20% to the regional share and 80% to the sub-regional share. Um, some of the survey results essentially found that this percentage split was acceptable, um, though there was some comment that the percentage split should be changed. Um, I, I think from the white paper's direction, uh, staff feels that additional discussion is really warranted. And I think it's important to note that it directly ties back to um, the future use of the regional share discussion as described uh, in number one, and the outcomes um, and the total amount of funds that are really to be allocated to the regional share. Uh, the third is for the regional share project review panel. Uh, so this is a newly created panel um, used to recommend the regional share projects to the Dr. Cog committees and board. Uh, again, looking at the results through the survey, uh, most felt that the regional uh, project review panel kind of met its objective, um, though uh, staff really feels that a thorough review of this panel's role is sort of merited just um, due to the fact that the panel is really new to the process itself. And again, I think another thing to point out is this really kind of relates back to the discussions to be had on the regional share, uh, only because you know if one outcome is that the regional share sort of goes away, uh, there is really no point in having a regional share project review panel. Um, the fourth is a review of the Dr. Cog staff scoring of projects in the sub-regional process. Uh, so if you recall in the sub-regional process, uh, each forum was allowed to either score their own applications or let Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog staff score them. Uh, I think uh, all forums with the exception of, a, of one or two really scored their own projects. Um, majority of the forums thought this was a positive change. Again, one of the results and outcomes of the survey, um, but it did take additional local staff time and many stated it was difficult to really maintain their objectivity. So one of the questions the white paper poses is simply, you know, should the scoring process be returned back to Dr. Cog staff or should it be kept as it is? Uh, and finally, a thorough review of the, the TIP focus areas. Um, so the TIP focus areas were developed with the concept of adjusting the focus areas, you know, every TIP cycle as either a way to sort of highlight certain transportation, transportation objectives within Metrovision 
are really to focus in on what is important to the region at that time of that tip cycle. So a question that is asked is, you know, should the tip focus areas continue to be part of the application process? Uh, finally, in the, the last section there of the white paper, uh, it lists seven minor and administrative changes that would positively change the process as a whole. Um, you know, it's important to note that many of these can either be handled by staff or with other technical, you know, and or form input. So some of these include um, just better interaction between Dr. Cog staff and the sub-regional forums. Um, you know, develop new or enhanced coordination, schedules, guidelines, rules, steps, and actions. Um, you know, some of these may include just how the applications are handled, um, local match partnerships, uh, local government support letters, checklists, and calendars. I think one thing that from a staff perspective is we were so focused on making sure the process went smoothly, there was a few of these things that kind of got lost in the mix to really help out the forum throughout the process. So that is one thing to, uh, to make sure that we work on for next time. Um, other, the other items include, um, you know, review and refine the application itself, just to make sure that it's kept relevant. Um, there's appropriate transportation uh, focus uh, with the questions, and really to remove the just to make sure there's no duplication within the questions themselves. Another was to review the, the scoring method of high, medium, low. Um, when staff to, uh, looked at the high, medium, low and translated that into project scoring, um, we simply said, you know, three points for a high and then one point for a low. Um, one thing that we noticed was that, um, for example, within the Adams County Forum, they expanded that scoring to be one to five. So I think it, it warrants a discussion to see if, just to make sure that the scoring system of um, high, medium, low translating into a three, two, or one um, is appropriate. Uh, and then finally, on you know, talking about the, the project scoring, um, develop the standard scoring sheets and methodology um, to use for all the reviewers. Now, whether this is uh, the four members themselves or just for Dr. Cobb. Uh, for the overall process, the report concludes that Dr. Cox, Dr. Cox staff feels the dual model process um, really was successful and generally continues to be supported by all those involved. Um, and I think overall, again, it was a, a quite a lengthy process to get there, but I think overall um, it meets everyone's objectives. Um, so that really concludes sort of the discussions that I had um, on the white paper here this afternoon. Uh, again, we're not looking for an action, action item or any, any type of recommendation this afternoon. Um, we do plan on having discussions with RTC at their meeting uh, later this month and at the November board work session um, just to gain their, their input as well. Uh, so at this time, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments that anyone may have. Are there any questions or comments for Todd? If you'd raise your hands and then uh, Melinda will unmute you. All right, thank or you. Or if you're on the phone. Oh, go ahead. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just waiting a few seconds just in case uh, there are any questions or comments. Looking for any hands. Okay, I think at this time we don't have any additional questions or comments. Okay, so do you, just so you know, Todd, I think overall the pro, this, the uh, dual process seemed to work very well this year. I know it took a lot of time and a lot of effort on Dr. Cog's staff and it was very much appreciated and also took a lot of time to develop and I appreciate the TAC members that helped develop that, so thank you. With that, thank we'll you. Uh, move on to the next information. We'll move on to the next uh, informational brief briefing and uh, get back to my top of my agenda here. Uh, it's uh, congestion management process and preliminary results of the 2018 annual report by Robert Spots and uh, Steve Cook. It's attachment C. So if uh, I'm not sure, Robert or Steve, take it away.
All right, look good. Can you see the screen? Yep. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, um, Robert Spots, uh, Mobility Analytics Program Manager. Uh, I'm gonna get a backup from Steve Cook here today. And I'll take this opportunity to um, briefly announce that we had a new uh, staff member join our team. Melissa Balding has joined us and she will be working on the congestion reports along with many of the other things we do in this program for future years. So. Uh, we're here today. I'm sorry this is 2018 in the agenda, but it's actually the 2019 annual report we're talking about. 2018 is a long, long time ago, and 2019 sure does feel like a long time ago as well. Um, you know, we're going to reminisce about that year when we could just, you know, hug strangers and blow out birthday candles and drive in uh, significantly more traffic than we're seeing this year. So it's always a little awkward. We're, we're this deep into the, the following year when we talk about the previous year. This is kind of how the, the way the data flows and by the time we can get collect everything we need and get the get everything tied up um, and prepare our report. The report is included in your packet today. Um, but we are going to talk about 2019. Even in the context of 2020, it is a pretty interesting year. Uh, we'll briefly just talk about this program we do every year, the changes to VMT, the vehicle miles traveled, trends we've been seeing, and then we will spend a little time on 2020 because that's obviously a, probably of more interest to everyone um, if, with a lot of interesting changes in travel behavior. So to begin, you know, this is, this is a program that we are federally required to uh, complete every year. We maintain a database that keeps track of uh, physical traits of the roads, volumes, transit routes, and we've been doing this since 2006. Um, one of the key things we report is uh, regional uh, vehicle miles traveled and person miles traveled. See how much people are traveling in this region and uh, the associated congestion with that travel. So just a reminder here, on an average weekday in our streets and highways in Denver in 2019, there was about 84 million vehicle miles traveled. Um, and that's about 110 million miles traveled by people in this region. That's all from about 15 million individual trips, people going to the grocery store, to schools, to jobs, to hospitals. And 13 million of those trips were made in cars and trucks, everything from delivery trucks, buses, to uh, people in their cars all by themselves. The really interesting thing about 2019, and if, it's, and if you can uh, kind of rewind the clock, the, the, it was really interesting. We did not see an increase in the regional daily VMT from 2018. That's despite um, growth in population, about 1.4% 1, 1 growth in population. And yet on a daily basis, we didn't really see any growth in vehicle miles traveled. So as a result of population growing without VMT growing, uh, we estimate that uh, weekday VMT per capita, which is one of our MetroVision targets, decreased from 25.7 to 25.4 miles per day. Not the largest jump, but um, we you know it is a significant thing. And all the sources we looked at kind of came to that same conclusion. Just to, moving on here to just look at the trends we've seen over the years. I, we've seen this graph for many years in this report and in these presentations. But again, there was no growth in VMT between 2018 and 2019 by our estimates. That follows you know, a strange, um, a unique time where we were coming out of this great recession and VMT was relatively stable, did not grow for a significant amount of time, ramped up and then looked like, you know, in, in 2015, 2016, VMT was really climbing on us. And then it's over the last two to three years, it really started to slow down again um, to this year where we did not see any VMT growth in 2019. Um, as a result, you know, like I said, VMT per capita di dipped down a little bit. We're still not at our target there, but our MetroVision target is currently at about 23 vehicle miles traveled per person in the region. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back here for just one second. And just you know, we we don't we don't exactly know why this happened. You know, there's 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 so much happening in this region, but we you know we have seen before COVID, but there was an uptick in the amount of people working from home. There has been a shift of land use where there's been a lot more people living in more high density areas uh, with better travel options. So, you know, there's there's a lot of unknowns. We can we can speculate about why this happened. Um, we are happy with the the relatively good news. That does not stop our efforts, our continuing efforts to manage congestion and VMT 
throughout the region. You know, there's some been exciting stuff happening around Dr. Cog, uh, including the kickoff of the Advanced Mobility Partnership, looking at technology, continued uh, support of transportation incident management programs. Way to go um, has been, you know, continuing to partner with PBM and transportation demand management programs throughout the region. The micro, micro mobility working group is in full swing, and then several major corridor studies looking at how to improve, improve um, mobility in various corridors throughout the region. Uh, we're going to flash this for a second, but you know th these are our main tenets of how to mitigate mitigate congestion in the region: either avoid it, adapt it, or alleviate it. Um, just to spend a, another second here, returning to this graph, you know, we, and we've talked about these kind of these periods we're calling them in previous reports as well. But you know, it, it kind of seems like something new is happening again here. So there was this first period of of consistent growth, and that go dates back all the way to the invention of the automobile. The Great Recession was kind of the first and longest period of time where VMT did not increase for a substantial amount of time. You know, there's this economic recovery that I just discussed pretty big recovery. And now we, we, you know, if we were doing this report and we kind of had a normal 2020 going on here, we'd still be kind of questioning whether whether there was a, a change happening here. There's so, so many new things happening in transportation from technology to telework, things like that. Now, you know, as we're entering, um, for 2020 is certainly <laughs> an interesting year that will presumably change things for a while at least, if not forever. So just to discuss this again, uh, you know, the only downturns in, in that first period were really World War II and the 70s energy crisis, but there was just really consistent growth. The second period, not the Great Recession, you know, we, we did see a flattening of VMT in 2007 before the Great Recession really hit, but there were high great gas prices during that time. And um, that's when we saw that those significant declines in VMT per capita. The third period, as I said, there was a booming economy in Denver. There was tons of construction and package deliveries. And already the way that we traveled and, and received goods and services was changing, a lot of more e-commerce um, and the big rebound in VMT during that period. And you know now we're entering this fourth period and we're just gonna pose a bunch of questions here, but um, was a new VM10, VMT trend beginning before the effects of COVID-19? and to us, it feels like that something was happening there. Um, now we don't know what will be the aftermath of COVID-19 effects on travel. How much of this teleworking um, will continue or people receiving packages instead of going to the store or getting groceries delivered, things like that. Will that change permanently? Um, I just said that. Um, and then fuel costs, we've continued to see fuel costs remain relatively low. We saw during the Great Recession, when those prices increase, uh, you know, along with the uh, effects of the economy, that that can really affect uh, the the amount of VMT in this region. Um, you know, we're, we're still you know, how will trips be distributed in the future? You know, transit has taken a really hard hit during this. Will that be able to recover in the near and long term futures? Um, Again, we're talk talking about technology. There's there's so much changing. We, we've seen the scooters, but now we're we're also looking at connected and automated vehicles as a potential in, in the in the long term future. How will this region develop in the future? Will we continue to have some more of this infill that we've seen, or will there be um, more development on the outskirts of the region, package and food deliveries, and um, yeah, also shared mobility and ride hailing services. So there's just so much unknown moving into the future. You know, it's, it's um, we're really going to have to take a look at, at this process we do, how, how we how we continue to monitor and maintain this database um, in the future, given that such such a dynamic and significant shift has happened this year. So um, just to briefly note, you know, the 2018 annual report, um, be, because there was 0% growth in VMT, there was no observable increase in regional c congestion levels in 2019. Uh, obviously, that's situational and varies across the region. But um, if, if you are looking at our current assumption about 2019's congestion levels, uh, you can refer to the 2018 report on annual Traffic, traffic congestion for the, the map and the performance measures that we typically provide uh, in the report. 
All right. So uh, moving on, just to, to give a, you know, we want to save some of this for next year, and there's all this still a lot changing and a lot of things to unpack about 2020. But just a, a preview, you know, from from, from Dr. Cog's perspective, um, looking at the data available to us, the most reliable data source that we've been able to acquire on, you know, relatively short notice, are uh, CDOTs, CDOTs, ATRs, the the traffic recorders that that record traffic. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We've got about 20 of them throughout the Dr. Cog region. And kind of aggregating those and really simplifying the outputs of what we've seen there. We estimate that during the peak of the stay at home orders, uh, you know, there was a, obviously a very significant drop to about 50% of what we'd normally expect in the month of April. And then that kind of sharply hiked up a bit to uh, you know in in May June we were seeing about 25% less than we typically expect in terms of vehicle miles traveled in May June and now it's looking like July August um you know we don't have data quite yet for September but it's looking like that reduction is is kind of stabilizing at about 15% less than we'd normally expect in um an August or September month like that we'll see if that continues to kind of inch back up to uh, what we, did, we would normally would have expected in an average year, or whether the, the continued you know, reduction in, in travel because of teleworking, reduced uh, sto visits to the store, et cetera, will kind of keep that about 15% reduction stabilized uh, moving forward into later this year. Did just want to give you an example of a single traffic recorder you know there's there is no average day um you know you can see in, in the beginning in february there was a snowstorm you can see how much that would affect a normal um day of travel on the left the, the axis for this one is the percent variation from a 2019 monthly average so as you can see january at this particular location was actually a little higher than january the previous year that snowstorm made uh that february count dip down below in most of these traffic count recorders, we saw an interesting little bump where people, there was a, a lot of travel happening right before uh, the stay at home orders that were highly rumored to happen, did happen. Um, and a lot of people seem to be stocking up on, on items during that uh, or mid-March period. And then you, you can see that 50% drop with uh, you know noise continuing in Memorial Day, July, but Overall, we're still, you know, probably about this was really leveled out to that 15% less than what would normally be happening during a month. The other thing this has had a really significant impact in is kind of the daily travel variation. So this blue line here, this is August 2019's uh, daily travel variation at Hamden, east of Sheridan, one of the traffic recorders. And you can see there what you might predict with an AM and PM peak. So in, in AM, uh, you know, people getting to work and and at five, six o'clock, people coming home, those high bumps in um, traffic. And that's when you see, obviously, the most congestion, when we're putting the most pressure on our systems. Um, when you look at what happened in April, not only is it obviously significantly less, but those peaks really smoothed out. But, you know, this type of curve is what we're used to seeing for something like a weekend travel, where it, rather than having that AM peak and PM peak, traffic kind of slowly builds up throughout the day and then ebbs off into the evening. And now looking at August 2020, you can see a lot of that has recovered. We're getting closer to where we were in August 2019. However, the shape is very different still. It's still kind of got that weekend type of shape where there's not that extremely high peak, especially in the PM and AM as well. So that, you know, that, that's really taking a lot of pressure off the roadway. You know, there is congestion out there again still in 2020. You know, I'm sure we've all experienced that, but we're typically not seeing those high intensity peaks where with severe congestion on the roadways. And that's partially because the travel is spread out um, a little bit more through the day rather than having those high peaks. Um, so yeah, high teleworking rates remain, especially amongst office workers. That's, a, you know, unfortunately, a significant reduction in transit ridership as well. People are continuing to get high levels of pack, package deliveries. You know, we've seen variations that throughout the region in VMT reductions and places like um, near Commerce City, where there's been a lot of freight and commercial activity. You, we just have never seen quite the reduction in VMT that we saw in other places in the region, um, partially because there's so much 
activity and getting getting packages delivered throughout the region. Um, another a bad story is crashes and fatalities. While they were down at first, kind of in the, the beginning of the stay-at-home orders, those have those have been back on the rise, especially when you look at it by at a rate level. The crashes per mile traveled have been no better than the previous year. We are, we uh, you know I think the general consensus is that that's because there's been some pretty dangerous levels of speeding out there. Um, but that's another thing we'll we'll definitely keep want to study in the future about why that is happening despite decreased um, traffic out there. Uh, as I mentioned with Commerce City and, and, uh, and other areas, there has been variational impacts across the region, places with high levels of office workers, obviously such as downtown or um, you know the US 36 corridor, which tends to carry a lot more office workers. The decreases were, were more significant than that 50% at times, and we're slower to climb back to that 15, 20% decrease that we're seeing now. And then the other thing, you know, if you're looking at daily pattern, the, the just minor decreases in traffic can result in major decreases in rush hour. A, a roadway, once it reaches that capacity, just a little more traffic can really, really slow things down. But if you never quite cross that threshold where the volume and is reaching the capacity level, then um, you know you might not you would not experience that same severe level of congestion. And I think we'll save the rest of 2020 for next year, although we'll be talking about it, I'm sure, along the way. So with that, I'll stop for questions. Are there any questions for Robert or Steve on this? And uh, Melinda, if they'll raise their hand and you unmute them, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, I will give everyone just a moment to get those hands raised. If there's any questions or comments. Okay, at this point, I'm not seeing any hands raised. If there's anyone on the phone, if you'd unmute yourself and speak. Not okay. hearing any there. We'll move on to the next uh, informational briefing. And Jacob Rieger will be presenting the status of developing a fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities for the 2050 Metro Vision Transportation Plan. Uh, Jacob, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, give me just a second to share my screen. For those of you on the line, um, Jacob did say when we get to the discussion on this, he's he's like to open it up to anyone on the line, not just TAC members. So, yeah, but, thank you, Mr. You know. Chair. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thanks again. Uh, wanted to give you an update on uh, where we stand on developing the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. As I get started, I do want to acknowledge and thank both everyone in the region, all of you and all of our stakeholders for everything that we've done to get to this point. As you'll see, still more work to do, but want to acknowledge everyone's efforts one more time, uh, particularly over July and August as we were developing candidate projects. And I also want to thank today. We recognize that today uh, is a holiday for some folks. Um, particularly for CDOT and maybe some others. Uh, so I do want to appreciate those who are still here um, today to be part of the conversation. So, um, okay, there we go. Um, so just an overview, a lot of slides, but we'll try and get through them pretty quickly today. Um, but obviously we want to talk about our candidate project solicitation and evaluation process. We want to show you the work in progress overall 2050 financial plan and particularly focus on our proposed uh, priority programs investment strategy. So there's a little bit of alliteration. And then kind of talk about where we're at in terms of identifying fiscally constrained project investments to start building uh, the 2050 plan. So this slide is more just kind of a reminder. You've seen this before. Um, just a reminder of our overall process and, and background, um, how we got here. Um, I won't go through this slide in detail, um, but just a reminder of the major steps that we've taken uh, so far in our planning process. Um, you've all seen this slide before many times too, but again, it's just that reminder of kind of that overall framework in which we're anchoring um, this work um, and that reminder to all of us of all of the great work that has been done collectively uh, throughout the region, not just by Dr. Cog, but by CDOT, RTD, um, all of you at the local agencies and local governments, that together this really is our vision. This really is our priorities. It's our needs, and it's that framework foundation that we've been using 
as we've been putting the 2050 plan together. Um, so starting to zero in now on kind of more recent work of the evaluation, um, the reminder starting at the sort of left here on the evaluation piece, um, that Dr. Cog's staff scored the candidate projects using MetroVision objectives. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, we had a regional evaluation panel that provided input. Uh, I'll talk about that in a couple slides as well. Um, then transitioning to what we're calling determining priorities, uh, which is what we call the interagency process, which is primarily Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, kind of working together to take all of this input received to date, all of the work that we're doing in the financial plan and start melding and synthesizing all those things together um, to come up with the draft 2050 program and project investment priorities. Um, those, of course, will come to you, um, to our other committees and to our board uh, to approve over the next month. Um, and, then, and then we'll transition into plan development. Kind of a reminder here as well that this process um, you all remember that you spent um, um, some really good time over the summer, spring and summer, talking with us about back in May and June. We actually had our board approve this um, project solicitation evaluation process at its July meeting. So, again, we wanted to be transparent with how we're going to work with the region. And everything you're seeing here is really sort of following that process that we agreed to together and that our board approved. Um, so let's talk a little bit more in detail about that candidate project solicitation and evaluation process. Um, through our work with all of you, meaning the county transportation forums, our partners at CDOT, uh, CDOT Region 1 and Region 4 in the Dr. Cog region, um, as well as RTD, we received a total of 137 uh, candidate projects that were submitted for evaluation. Um, again, I would emphasize these are, we're talking about a 30-year long-range plan, right? This is a 2015 plan. So some of these projects are very conceptual in nature. This is not the tip. Um, you know, this is sort of long-range. Uh, so some of these projects are concepts. Some of these are fuzzy. Some of them were a little bit more tangible. But however they got to us, we got 137 projects or project concepts that we were asked to evaluate um, through this process that we've been working with you all on. As I mentioned, um, we, we qualitatively scored um, these projects, again, going back to the process that we agreed to and was approved by our board. Um, so this shows kind of, you know, sort of that scoring. You know, I say qualitative, there were points involved, but it was really sort of a qualitative assessment. This is the one time when I'll say it was a little bit like the TIP. Um, every other time I say this was not the TIP process, and it wasn't. But as Todd described earlier in terms of that qualitative scoring, that, you know, three was, three was high, one was low. Uh, we borrowed that, that piece of that same approach in terms of looking at how did these projects sort of address or align to our Metro Vision plan primary objectives, um, as well as some federal criteria from the SAST Act uh, that we're required to include um, in this type of process. So the projects were scored by a diversity of several uh, Dr. Cog staff in two divisions. We purposely wanted um, sort of a, a spectrum of perspectives and um, and, and um, perspectives of, excuse me, spectrum of perspectives uh, and viewpoints from, you know, various different Dr. Cog staff so that we could, um, you know, make that scoring as fair as possible. Again, it is qualitative scoring, but we wanted to, uh, we wanted to make that as fair and, and equitable as possible in that work that we did. Uh, one of the attachments in this item is the sort of resulting spreadsheet where we showed the scores by kind of an average score, which was taking all six scores and just doing an average of them. Um, again, to even more sort of equalize out um, different viewpoints. We did also do a cumulative score. And then the other thing that's shown in that attachment is, um, appreciate this suggestion, was to show not every forum ranked the projects that you submitted to us, but several of you did. And so we wanted to honor that and show that as part of, um, part of the array of listing of the projects. So um, on that attachment, you can see each of those three types of scores or three, three data points uh, for each of the candidate projects. Um, we also did a map. Um, again, this is a work in progress. We, we acknowledge that we're still kind of, you know, working through this, but we at least wanted to visually kind of show uh, the location of the candidate projects that we received. Um, as you can see on this map, obviously, I think a pretty good spread kind of throughout the region, um, you know, sort of geographic equity, which is something that we know is important to all of us. And then we also wanted to show along with this on this map, the projects that are automatically carrying forward from the 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, and I hope you all remember this part of the conversation uh, from back in the spring and summer, that there were a set of projects that, um, you know, they're, they're in the NEPA process or they've been funded for construction, the TIP, or whatever it is, they are far enough along that we wanted to bring those projects forward um, automatically from 2040 to 2050. 
One of the things that we've been working on is to actually put these two maps together. So I'll briefly cycle through them. Um, again, this first one is candidate projects map. So this is gonna continue to change as we get closer um, to our recommended project investment priorities. But the point is that at the end of the day, we'll put a map like this together with a map like this so we can tell that complete story of um, the corridors and for transit, you know, transit projects, the service associated with them, you know, together sort of the, the, the spectrum of projects that we're trying to show and the complete sort of nature of each of those projects, that they're not just different lines on different maps, that some of them do connect together either geographically, point A to point B, or the type of project, again, it is like, say, transit service um, that operates from point A to point B. Um, so again, I already talked about the spreadsheet a little bit. Um, <clears throat> from there, once we, once Dr. Cog's staff qualitatively scored um, the projects, we convened a regional evaluation panel. So a reminder of this, this was a staff representative from each of the county transportation forums uh, and from our two mountain counties as well, Clear Creek and Gilpin, as well as staff from Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. These folks met twice, I believe it was on September 8th and September 11th. Um, so this was the first group that saw everything that you just saw. This was the first group that saw the scoring um, of the project, saw them all arrayed on a map. And this was the first group sort of the tackle of, you know, trying to make sense of this. What does this tell us about um, next steps for moving forward? We purposely left the charge of this group pretty flexible um, in terms of, you know, did they want to start narrowing the field of projects? Did they want to attack this in some other way? Over the course of the two meetings, what you see here on the screen is that um, they asked us to sort of keep that conversation at a higher regional level and really focus on, again, what is that framework? What are those priorities in terms of important things, concepts, um, points that we should take forward as we get into the interagency process to actually recommend uh, specific uh, project and program investments? So I won't go through each of these bullet points individually, but you know, I think touch on a lot of the themes that we've already started talking about here today. Uh, regional equity, um, you know, safety, air quality, some of these other things. Um, you see at the bottom, you know, we did start with a conversation about whether we narrow the list or not. Uh, but as you see at the sort of under the third uh, main bullet, you know, they said it was okay to keep the entire candidate list for the moment and bring that into uh, the interagency process with the input uh, shown here on the screen. So I do want to pause here and give a chance for anyone who is on uh, the regional evaluation panel to either chime in or supplement. Um, how I've characterized what's on this slide in terms of the regional evaluation panel conversations. Is there any, if you'd like to chime in, please raise your hand and um, Melinda will un unmute you. Have any hands been raised, Melinda? I would, I would go ahead and proceed, Jacob. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'm looking at myself. I don't think I see any hands raised, so I'm going to go ahead and continue. If we did miss someone, we can certainly bring it up as part of the uh, discussion at the end. My apologies. Uh, my, I, I thought I was unmuted. Uh, no, we don't have any hands raised. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will continue. Um, the next thing that we did is you all will hopefully recall that we have two um, in part in terms of our public engagement, we have two uh, specialized groups that we've been working with throughout this process, our civic advisory group, um, which is a collection of folks that represent vulnerable population communities that we want to intentionally reach out to as part of our 2015 planning process. And we also have our youth advisory panel. Um, and we asked both of those groups to weigh in on um, this work in terms of candidate projects and um, importance and, uh, and evaluating those projects. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Lisa Hood, uh, to talk about the input we received from both groups. Thanks, Jacob. Hi, everybody, Lisa Hood here. I have just a few slides to give you an update on what we heard from our advisory group meetings last September. As you'll remember, um, some of the key guidance and priorities that we've been hearing from these two groups in the earlier phases of engagement were the high importance of investment in transit and travel choices like walking and biking, as well as equitable access to transportation and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So we wanted to get their input on this project evaluation step 
and we held um, a meeting for each group in early September. And the way that we got their input, rather than having them go through the 137 uh, projects that were received and scoring them like staff does, we decided to create essentially eight illustrative product projects. So we took, there were kind of eight typical categories of the type of projects that were submitted. And we took each of those and we gave them a quick summary, including just a really brief um, explanation of the context of the area, what the problem is that they're trying to solve, and what the project is that's, um, that's proposed, and then the why. And all of this information was really gathered from um, those submittals that, that you all submitted. So um, we, and then what we did was we did interactive polling. If, if you all are familiar with the tool Mentimeter, we used that tool to ask them three big questions about each of those eight projects. So the first was, how well does the project support public input priorities? The second was, how well does it meet the Metro Vision objectives that we're using? And then the third was just generally, how, does, how well does the project solve the problem it's trying to address? So I'll give you a, a summary of um, what those results were. It was interesting. It's always interesting to compare the youth advisory panel with the civic advisory group because you start to see how the adults become more skeptical. <laughs> um, but the youth advisory panel rated, um, you'll see the differentiation between scores is uh, much different on the civic advisory panel, but there were some similarities in terms of the highest and lowest rated projects. So you're seeing the, the averages for each of those eight projects that we did. Um, the highest rated were, was a project that was a regional bike trail, another project that focused on safety improvements for bikes and pedestrians, and then a road widening that had bike and pedestrian facilities. Those were the three highest for the youth advisory panel. And the lowest for rated by the youth advisory panel was um, a road widening with medians and side paths and interchange and manage lanes on a highway. And then compare that to our civic advisory panel. You can see the, the skepticism of adulthood <laughs> or the pessimism, uh, a lot lower scores you can see on those, but the are a lot more differentiation between what they liked and didn't like, I suppose. So the highest rated were um, was the safety improvements for bike and pedestrians, so similar to what the youth advisory panel rated highly. High capacity transit was another one, and then the, region, the same regional bike trail project that the youth uh, liked as well. And then lowest rated was road widening with bike and pedestrian facilities, the managed lanes on a highway, and road widening with medians and side paths. And after we did that rating, that interactive polling, we also just did kind of a general discussion about what they thought of the eight illustrative projects and what kind of feedback they would want to be shared with groups like you, uh, the Regional Transportation Committee and the board. And so what we heard from the advisory groups was really a general concern about road widenings not being in line with public input or the Metro Vision objectives. They also said that some of the projects didn't seem to reflect the public input because the input showed priorities of transit and environmental issues, but many of the projects focused on congestion and road widening. We also heard from many of the advisory group media, uh, members that the projects were too vehicle focused and they weren't focused enough on providing other choices for people to travel. And then we just generally heard a lot of skepticism of how significantly emissions are actually reduced by adding lanes and more capacity for more cars. So kind of the general themes that we heard um, in addition to those points is that we need to be moving people towards we need to be moving towards providing people other viable options than driving, and that we should focus on improving our existing infrastructure, adding choices for people um, to travel a different way, rather than adding lanes or increasing capacity to solve problems. And they did have a lot of support for the collaborative efforts between local governments on projects. They liked that. And just generally, um, uh, high levels of support from our advisory groups for options that provide better pedestrian, bike, and transit infrastructure, which is really in line with the the um, the input that we've been getting from them throughout the phases of engagement. And I think that's my last slide. I'll pass it over to Jacob. Okay. Thank you very much, Lisa. So we are in the home stretch of this presentation, but we do want to cover a few more things. 
Um, I did want to talk about the interagency process. So this is the next step in the kind of board approved um, process in terms of how we were going to navigate through the 2050 planning process. Um, again, the reminder, the interagency process is Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD uh, working really closely together. Um, as you see here, we met, I think, what, five times in in two weeks or something like that. It's um, been really, and, and we really appreciate that collaboration between our partners at RTD and CDOT um, to kind of work through all of this input, all of the candidate projects, everything that we've done to date, um, as well as the financial plan work that Alvin's going to present in just a moment, um, and really start putting this all together and start thinking about, you know, how do we start stitching this together to create uh, the 2050 fiscally constrained uh, regional transportation plan. Um, some discussion points here that we've kind of been talking about in our interagency process, um, you know, approach to projects with multiple submittals. You all remember in your forum meetings that we said, you know, have a couple backup projects in case that um, when we see the project list from CDOT and RTD in case there's a duplicate project. I will say at the end of the day, while there were some projects that seemed quote unquote duplicate or overlap, at the end of the day, we erred in the scoring primarily on including both versions of those projects with maybe a couple of exceptions. And I think that was, uh, we had a lot of kind of one-off meetings with some of you. Um, and I think the input we heard is that, you know, look, our forum, you know, for example, you know, approve this, this project, this version of this project, we want you to carry that forward in the scoring. And that's what we did. Um, regional agency positions on projects submitted on their system or those that would impact their system. Um, again, we had, you know, forum submitted projects on state highways. We had transit projects that weren't submitted by RTD. Um, and that's kind of what we promised at the beginning that we wanted everyone to think big, to think creatively. And part of this process, which we're at now, is to sort of, again, stitch that together into a cohesive, you know, sort of um, co cohesive uh, end product. Um, and then finally, we've been working towards uh, fiscal constraint, which is one of our most major federal requirements, many federal requirements associated with a long range plan. Uh, but one of the biggest is at the end of the day, uh, we need to identify through our planning horizon through 2050, the anticipated revenues collectively from our three agencies and, and throughout the region that we think will be available um, to uh, fund these projects and to show um, show the projects and, and programmatic investment priorities that we ultimately include in the plan that we do have the revenues um, to pay for. Um, again, in a, in a sort of, you know, 30 year monopoly kind of sense, revenues available to pay uh, for the types of things that we put in the plan. So I think our next slide, I'm going to transition over to um, Alvin uh, to talk about the financial plan. As I do that, though, that's a good segue uh, for one thing that we wanted to bring up in particular with TAC. One of the things that we've been considering as Dr. Cog staff and in our agency process is that, um, and again, as a reminder here, and you'll see this in the financial plan that Alvin will present in just a moment, that we're collecting, we're sort of, we're sort of integrating all of the revenues and expenditures that, you know, make our multimodal transportation system work in this region, you know, through 2050 in this case. So it's the big projects, it's the programmatic things, it's the day-to-day -day maintenance and sidewalks, and you know, again, everything that goes into our multimodal transportation system. The revenues, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily, come from the three regional agencies. Um, and that's why it's such a big part of our interagency process, the revenues that are controlled by Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD. There are local governments, whole highway authority, and other pieces of revenues as well. One of the things that we've been considering is the notion um, of should we include in the 2050 financial plan a regional source of revenue sort of tracking with, you know, some of the ballot measures that have come up in recent years or some other sort of reasonable source in other words, by 2015, even though we haven't done it yet as a state or as a region, in the next 30 years, is it reasonable to assume that at least this region, if not the state, would come together on some type of additional transportation funding? And if so, should we include that as part of the financial plan? Uh, so that's, that's a topic that we wanted to raise, and I'd ask you to keep that in your back of your mind as Alvin goes through the financial plan. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Alvin Vidal-Sanchez, who will walk you through both the work in progress overall 2050 financial plan, as well as what we're calling the priority programs investment uh, strategy and proposal that, that the interagency process has. Alvin? Thanks, Jacob. You can go and go on to the next slide. So attachment five in the packet provides a high-level summary of the fiscal constraint of each of the three regional agencies, so CDOT, RTD, and Dr. Cog. We did want to focus on Dr. Cog right now and what we're calling our Dr. Cog administered funding. We anticipate about 2.8 billion being available out to 2050. For comparison, those 107 projects that Jacob mentioned earlier in the presentation, if you were to 
take those and then combine them with the projects that we committed to carrying over from our 2040 plan into 2050, we would need at minimum 6.4 billion to meet the investments that were requested through our solicitation and carryover process. So this exercise, our fiscal constraint exercise is being combined with all the input that you just heard from both Lisa and Jacob. And we're proposing this priority investment program strategy that we think reflects regional priorities that we hope reflects regional priorities and also gives us a chance to show projects that we historically might not have shown in our previous RTPs. So beyond those air quality, reasonably significant roadway or transit capacity projects. One way we're doing that is actually looking at how we already do it in the TIP, where we have established these set-asides where we're funding program projects like our operations and technology projects, our TDM projects, uh, our air quality projects. So we're proposing carrying that forward into our RTP and showing our TIP set-asides as a strategy. A priority has also been continuing to move forward on RTD's regional BRT study. So actually, starting to build out a regional BRT network. One thing we heard from the locals and the regional agencies were some projects that were on corridors where they would like to see transit at some point by 2050. Uh, these right now could include projects that are right now just improving the operations or the safety of the project or of the corridor, but they could ultimately in the long run provide a benefit for any future transit or enhanced transit on those corridors. As a reflection of the priorities we've heard from this group, from the input from our advisory groups and the public at large, we are proposing two programs, one called an Arterial Safety Regional Vision Zero program, and then the second, an Active Transportation program. These could be tied to our respective plans, the Taking Action on Regional Vision Zero and our Active Transportation plan. So this would give us a chance to start highlighting the work that's being done in the region on these specific types of projects. And then last would just be the projects that we have already committed to carrying over from 2040. So that would include the CDOT directed projects as well as the Dr. Cog directed projects. So if you remember, we have about 2.8 billion that we're anticipating available in terms of Dr. Cog administered funding. If you were to start subtracting what we're proposing in terms of tip set asides, our contributions to the regional BRT network and the transit corridor planning investments, and then also subtract our safety and our active transportation programs, we're left with about 1.6 billion that could go to what we're calling multimodal capital projects. Now of that total, we're already having to take some away because it's claimed from projects that we're automatically carrying forward. So that's almost 200 million in projects that are Dr. Cog directed funded that we're saying we'll be carrying forward. And that leaves about 1.4 billion for new projects that we currently don't list in the RTP. Looking at the split for the full 2.8 billion that we're anticipating being available, about 1.2 billion or 42% would go to the programs and the set-asides that you saw on the previous slide. So the TIP set-asides, our contributions to the BRT network and the transit corridors, and then the safety and the active transportation programs. Then that leaves that 1.6 billion that I just went through that includes automatic carryover projects and new multimodal capital projects that we haven't listed before. Okay, thank you very much, Alvin. I think that this is our very close to the end, um, but wanted to sort of summarize here, and we did this in the memo as well with links. Um, but, you know, again, we've had conversation with TAC and in other forums about, you know, our overall planning framework and what the inputs are. So we just wanted to be very transparent and sort of collect all in one place, um, everything that we've talked about together through this planning process that's sort of feeding the work that we're doing to create the 2015 uh, fiscally constrained and the ultimate 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So I'm not going to go through these individually, um, but we can come back to them in uh, in conversation. Um, so finally today, um, again, the status of developing the fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities, um, seeking input from you today about uh, carrying forward um, that we would carry forward into the remainder of the interagency process to develop those fiscally constrained uh, project and program investment priorities, um, continuing with the interagency process, <clears throat> again, completing those recommendations, and then bringing that back to you at the October 26 TAC meeting, where we will ask you to be taking action on recommending um, action on um, draft fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities um, to continue to build the 2050 plan. 
So uh, we know we just kind of dumped a lot on you. Um, so we wanted to come up with some questions maybe to guide the conversation a little bit. Um, so one is, are these the right programs to include in the investment strategy? Does this seem to reflect regional priorities? In addition to the regional valuation panel's guidance that I showed you earlier, uh, what else should our regional agencies consider as we complete the interagency process? And then finally, what factors are most important to guide uh, priority investments? Do we have those on the table already? Is there additional input um, that we would want to include? And then finally, I'll kind of add the fourth question I just gave you a few minutes ago. Um, is there any input on sort of a regional funding source uh, that we might want to include in the 2015 financial plan? So with all of that, thank you, Mr. Chair, and happy to open it up to uh, questions and conversation. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to speak, to raise your hand, and Melinda will call on you and unmute you. Um, I would like to break this up. Let's start with the first question. Are these the right programs to include in the investment strategy? So let's let's concentrate on that first. Uh, are is there any hands or people that want to speak? Be sure to raise your hand and Melinda will call on you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It uh, looks like our first question or comment is from Art Griffith. And Art, I have unmuted you. You're good to go. Yeah, thanks for bringing up that uh, slide there. You read my mind um, bringing that slide up. Could you spend a minute, Jacob, explaining how those percentages that would be allocated um, to those? And then where does uh, finishing out fast tracks fit in? In which of those categories? Where does front range rail fit in? I mean, just uh, go go over how you came up with that, those breakdowns there, uh, other sure. than, of course, the carryover. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question, Art. Thank you. So let me start with the easy math, and then I'll turn to Alvin for the hard math. Um, so on this screen, I'm showing you, as Art alluded to, the uh, draft um, investment program strategy that we're proposing. The amounts that you see here are estimated amounts, and they were basically created by um, sort of thinking about uh, either, you know, in the case of the tip set aside, kind of what are we spending in those tip set aside, and what would it look like to project those forward. Uh, the regional BRT network that really comes from um, RTD's regional BRT evaluation study and other inputs that we had through the interagency process of a good estimate of, you know, what some of these specific corridors building this network uh, would look like over time. Um, so, again, I, I won't go through these individually, but it was that same sort of logic of looking either at um, kind of what's out there, um, what do we have to draw from, what are we spending, you know, what do we think is an appropriate level of, of investment. Um, again, sort of keeping that balance that we do need to uh, that we do need to keep in mind uh, on some of these things. And then uh, let me let me answer the rest of Art's question, and then I'll ask Alvin for one clarification. Um, but Art mentioned both fast tracks and front range rail. Uh, let me start with fast tracks. I don't want to speak on behalf of RTD. It has most certainly been a topic um, of intense conversation during the interagency process. Um, I think the answer that I'll give from the Dr. Cog staff perspective is. We are cognizant of everything that RTD is going through and all the change that RTD is experiencing right now. Um, as I think most of you know, they have temporarily paused their reimagine RTD process. Uh, they're about to get a new uh, CEO, general manager, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of change going on over there. We fully recognize that um, once RTD is able to sort of complete all of the things that they have in motion um, in a year or two, um, that we will probably need to come back and do a major amendment uh, to what by then will be the 2050 adopted MVRTP. Um, so really, we want to honor RTD's ability to sort of work through a lot of those, you know, sort of transit policy, transit future um, type, type questions, and then bring those into our 2050 plan at the appropriate time. So that's my answer on fast tracks. Um, on front range passenger rail, uh, with the disclosure that many of you know, I am the vice chair of the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail uh, Commission, so I can make the joke that, you know, of course I want to see that in the long range plan. Um, but again, just to be objective about it, um, the Rail Commission is working through um, in a partnership with CDOT and what we call the blended team, uh, commission staff, CDOT staff, and the consultant uh, that we've had helping us navigate through this work of going through uh, the project development and service development plan process um, to get the project in a place to enter into NEPA hopefully early next year. So there's a lot of work that's being done, but there's a lot of work still to do. Um, as we sit here today, I don't have a fiscally constrained front range rail project that I can include in a slide like this in terms of fiscally constrained investment, um, but we will most certainly 
on the transit vision and some of the other ways that we can incorporate you know, some of these bigger picture things, be able to bring those forward so that they're part of the 2050 MVRTP. So that was a long answer to a good question. Um, Alvin, I'm gonna ask you to clarify, let me get to the right slide, because I think this was part of Art's question. Alvin, could you clarify, I think it's this slide that Art's asking about, how did we come up with this balance between, um, you know, kind of these programmatic, you know, investment things and we're dedicating to potential projects? Yeah, happy to, Jacob. So I would uh, first start with, we didn't, we didn't, initially begin the conversation about how much of our money or percentage of that money should go to these types of programs. Uh, it was ultimately about figuring out what's already out there. So the tip set aside, so we know how much on average we're spending, uh, the BRT network, the transit corridor, planning investments, we know what that could look like if we want to build out those particular corridors. So I would say we first started with costs that are already out there, what we could contribute to those programs versus starting with a particular percentage. So this is just these percentages are just how it fleshed out with the current strategy that we're proposing. Thank you. I did have a follow-up question. If you go back to slide 21, it's kind of directly related. Um, Art, help me in presentation mode. I don't see the, oh, yes, I do. Well, you, there slide. you go. There you go. Okay. Perfect. So, um, you know, this, Arterial Safety Regional Vision Zero says 400 million. And so, um, you know, we're looking at this safer Main Street uh, initiative, which is 77 million. So 400 million by 77 is about five. So does that mean we're only funding five years of Vision Zero in a, a 30 year plan? I'm, I'm not sure how these numbers here correlate for how much money you're setting aside per year of a, uh, like the tip set aside, or even that example I gave you on arterial safety program. Could, could you expand like what are these millions of dollars in over what period? Yeah, so thanks Art. Um, so again, for all of these, it's over the 30 years of the plan, first of all. So this is a sort of 30 year investment. I'd encourage us maybe for the most part, not to think of these as a year by year, because a lot of these things will kind of come in chunks. You know, for example, if you build a single um, BRT corridor, that's a lot of investment that will take some time to, um, to implement. Um, so what we tried to look at was you put it all together over the 30 year period. You know, what are these sort of total buckets that we think we might want to have in terms of amounts to invest in these what we think are policy programmatic things over time. When it comes to the arterial safety and the regional vision zero, I mean, first of all, you know, the first point is just that's super important, I think, to us and to the region. Um, and so that's why we're reflecting it here. We want to have a programmatic element in the 2050 plan that recognizes the work, not just that we've done on regional vision zero, but I'd bring in CDOT, I'd bring in local jurisdictions as well. Uh, CDOT has the um, uh, strategic transportation safety plan, a couple of jurisdictions have done regional vision zero plans or, or equivalent. Um, so it's honoring sort of that regional commitment to safety um, and vision zero and having a programmatic category, um, you know, reflecting that investment in the long range plan. Um, in terms of the 400 million specifically, Alvin or Ron, can you jog my memory on how we got to that number? Um, this so is, is that 13 million per year for just Dr. Cog money? Yeah, our, this, is, this is Ron, thanks for the question. Um, I would, first of all, um, say that the $77 million is like a three, over a three-year investment and, you know, was a was a pretty um, kind of special circumstance, special opportunity. Um, I think we're looking at balancing all of the various investment priorities and needs. This is just um, a proposal for a programmatic allocation sort of in. There may also, you know, there would be, there's kind of a programmatic yet to be determined projects sort of through tip cycles and then some specific projects to be identified specifically in the RTP um, that sort of fit within this category of investment, but trying to project out over the 30 years sort of a level, a sustainable level of investment in that category relative to, you know, all of the investment needs that we have. Art, did that answer your question? Thanks. But that, that would uh, average to out to like about 13 million per year, I think. I think that's about right. 
Uh, just a clarification, Jacob, before we move on. Um, so the fast tracks wasn't included in the carryover projects from 2040? Um, no, to be honest, they are not because what is what was fiscally constrained for fast tracks in the 2040 plan is now open for service. The uh, North Metro line, the end line opening in September was the last sort of fiscally constrained investment for fast tracks in the 2040 plan. So the conversation has been around the status of the unfinished components um, of fast tracks. Um, and again, as we sit here now, those are not included uh, in the 2050 plan. Okay, I, I'll have to look back. I guess I thought the 2040 plan included the inline up to Highway 7. So that's the reason I was asking the question. Yeah, it does not, Mr. Chair. That That's one of the four unfinished pieces of fast tracks. And at some point we had to take that out of the 2040 plan because it was no longer fiscally constrained. Okay, thank you. Uh, Melinda, are there other people that have questions? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our next question or comment is from Deborah Basket. So Deborah, go ahead. Hello, this is Deborah Basket with the City of Westminster. Um, my reaction to the slides Dr. Cox's staff has presented is they are a great reflection of what Dr. Cog's policy bodies and local jurisdictions for the most part have been talking about for a long time. They really resonate for me and build on work that we've been doing and stating is important. Um, I really think it's just important to reiterate things like how are we moving the most people in the same amount of space that is environmental and reduces our carbon footprint. Um, we can't say enough about saving people's lives and reducing injuries. Uh, so um, I, I want to commend Dr. Cogstaff. I think that you're reflecting back what um, the policy directions have been for a number of years on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, are there other comments, Belinda? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, we had a question written into the question pod from Eileen Yazi, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute her now and let her ask her question if she still needs to. Eileen, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, going. This presentation has been really helpful. Um, what I found, and kind of to a, a few of Art's questions, um, I'm not too sure if you're actually able to show attachment five and attachment six. I feel like that those are visually the attack, the actual attachments themselves are really helpful to see kind of that under and grab an understanding of the CDOT administered funds, RTD administered funds, and how they are not included in this. Nothing bad about that, but just how they are not. Um, and related to that attachment um, is one of the questions I had, um, it kind of, some of these have specific projects like the regional BRT network has specific projects listed, um, transit quarter planning investments as well. I'm not too sure what the difference are of the two. Um, if you could talk about that, I think that would be helpful. That's my first question. And then the, the second part is, um, to what Deborah actually just asked is, what does this mean to the to the network? Have we modeled this? Um, because I, I think it's just um, having past experience with modeling is that if we load these BRT networks, I'm curious what that what is that going to do for related to our goals about um, shifting mode shift, air quality, and things like that. Yeah, thanks, Eileen. Um, so let me try and tackle those questions. Please remind me if I forget uh, one of the questions that you asked. Uh, one of your first questions was, what's the difference between the regional BRT network and the transit corridor planning investments? First of all, these names are a little bit flexible. These are the terms we've come up with. But the, the strategic difference between the two is that we feel very strongly in the regional BRT network. I mean, RTD has done the regional BRT feasibility study. They did the uh, NAM study. There's been a lot of work in this space, like we kind of know some of these, you know, candidate projects. We know what some of these strong projects are. And we felt, frankly, comfortable to put ourselves out on a limb and actually propose a beginning network of, you know, of a regional BRT system in this region by 2050. And the logic there is that, you know, look, if we did a corridor, if we did a BRT corridor about once every five years or so, 
you know, you're building up to something by 2050. And that's, that's specifically what we're proposing. So that's pretty specific in that sense, based on the work, reflecting the work that's been done in this region to date. We also recognize, <clears throat> excuse me, apologies for my voice. We also recognize that there are other corridors in which there is a strong interest in multimodalism, in transit, uh, transit planning, transit enhancement, multimodal corridors. Um, those might not be quite as far along as some of these regional BRT corridors, um, but we recognize the need there, the sort of policy priority, uh, the potential investment in those corridors. And so we're trying to reflect that as well in the long range plan of actually looking at some of these corridors and actually proposing some investment in these corridors to continue their journey um, to get ready for an enhanced transit enhanced transit type of type of condition by 2050, even if we don't know quite as exactly what that might look like, as opposed to um, some of these BRT corridors. Um, so that's the difference there. You asked about, uh, as well, I leaned toward the modeling. Oh, sorry, is there a... No, okay. and then, yeah, I, the second part of that question was about, okay, so actually going back to that, the, the question, the, the transit corridor planning investments. So, the short is, is yes, that's money for capital or some type of multimodal improvement or some type of transit operation improvement, correct? That's like, that's like it's, it's not like a planning study. Obviously, we wouldn't be spending $200 million on a planning study, but that's for an actual capital project of some sort. It honestly, I mean, could be some combination. Um, again, we've got some corridors in the transit corridor bucket that are in different stages um, of their evolution. And that was one of the inputs from the regional evaluation panel is recognizing that not all these projects start out in the same place. Some are conceptual, some are farther along. So it could be for some planning as needed to bring those corridors along. Um, for corridors that are a little bit farther along, yes, it could be for the beginnings of some type of capital or service investment in those corridors. Okay. And then the second part of my question was about modeling and have we um, loaded these ideas and to some degree specific projects into the model to understand if they've moved the needle. We have not yet as of yet. That's actually the next major step in this process. Once, once we all agree and once we have our board sort of approve the uh, fiscally constrained project investments, um, that's actually what gets modeled for air quality conformity. So recognizing that that's a big piece, but not the entire piece of what goes into the 2050 plan. I mean, remember, throughout this process, we're talking about, and, and you all have seen the slide before, that there's many ways that we express priorities in the plan. One of those is through major capital projects, but it's also through the financial plan, as you're seeing on this slide. It's through text in the plan. It's through several other ways. So the point there is, is that we're not going to, and we frankly can't model every single thing that we're talking about, but the next major step in this process is to model those fiscally constrained uh, multimodal projects the best that we can um, and actually conduct air quality conformity analysis on um, on that network and that's actually a federal requirement as well all right and then i have one last i have hey, one Eileen. last oh, sorry yeah Eileen, sorry this is ron i'll just i'll just wanted to supplement jacob's answer to that a little bit remember back that we did a pretty significant scenario evaluation process where we did we did model some packages of investments right some pretty significant investments in in packages so we do have a sense while you know we may not we may not be may not have modeled this specific set of brt investments you know we did we did a major transit sort of investment scenario um, and evaluated the results of that we did um a, a pretty a significant sort of um, transportation alternatives scenario and modeled um, some changes and results related to that. So we do have a pretty good sense uh, that those types of investments do help move the needle for our regional objectives around air quality and greenhouse gas emissions and reducing VMT demand. So, you know, it was that, that work that we did in the scenario evaluation uh, with all of you has helped inform some of these investment priorities so far. Okay, that's, yeah, no, definitely that scenario planning, that's kind of what I was thinking back to. Um, and then kind of one of my last questions is related to freight. How does freight fit in with these priority investment programs? Yeah, that's a good question, Eileen. So um, I hate to sort of say, well, it depends, and there's multiple ways, but that is a true answer. To the extent, and we did receive as part of the 137 candidate projects, we did receive a few uh, freight projects. We asked for freight projects. We did get some. So to the extent that we can kind of show those and maybe model those, that's one way that it gets included. 
Um, other ways is we will have in the final financial plan um, likely a section sort of dedicated to uh, freight investment. Like some of these other things, you know, we've recently completed a multimodal freight plan. Uh, CDOT and others have done work on freight. So part of part of our, our big strategy here, and I hope it's coming through, is that the 2050 MVRTP is really a vehicle to further implement a lot of the great work that the region has done. And in fact, I'm going to skip back without making people dizzy. Really quick, when we come back to here, um, the 2050 plan is as much as anything, you know, the vehicle to help implement a lot of what you're seeing um, on this slide, including uh, the freight plan work that Dr. Cog and others have done. So again, it is a combination of projects, um, probably some financial investment in the financial plan, text for sure, incorporating the multimodal freight plan that Dr. Cog did into, it will become part of the constellation of things that comprise uh, the 2050 and VRTP as well. Okay, but there's not a specific program dedicated to freight. We haven't initially in terms of, and let me come back to that slide that we've been looking at. Yeah, um, Yeah, we didn't specifically identify it here, but understand, here we go, understand that the final financial plan will include obviously much more than this. And there's a whole set of kind of programmatic type categories beyond what, what's showing here that we will include in the financial plan. For example, you're not seeing on this slide asset management and maintenance. Well, look, we certainly believe that's a priority. We certainly believe that's hugely important to the region. Not identified here, but it will be in the final financial plan. And I put freight in that same category. Huh, okay. I'll 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 stop for now. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Melinda, are there any other hands raised? For this question, and remember the question is, are these the right programs to include in the investment strategy? Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, looks like our next question or comment is from Brian Weimer. Brian, you're self-muted. You'll just need to unmute. Your there you go. Thank you, and I've been cutting in and out on uh, connection, so I apologize if this has been answered. But my question really centers around, you know, one of the goals within Metro Visions deals with operating, managing, and maintaining a transportation system. So where does maintenance fit into the plan and these topics that you, or these categories that you've identified? Yeah, thanks, Brian. That is a good question. And that is, I think, what Eileen just touched on as well. So let me, let me try and clarify just a little bit more in the sense of each of our agencies, the three regional agencies, um, is, is part of putting together the draft financial plan, have really given a lot of thought to how do you allocate sort of those scarce limited revenues towards um, maintaining the system that we have, um, but also you know, towards projects and investments to sort of evolve the system, grow the system over time, right? So again, part of the final financial plan will, there will be a big piece that includes that sort of asset management, state of good repair, maintenance, um, needs of the regional transportation system. Uh, Ron, I don't know if you want to, or Alvin, want to add to that? I could, I mean, uh, certainly can supplement that a little bit just in the fact that, you know, Dr. Cog directed funds are not really available for operations and maintenance, right? For the most part, we, they're CMAC funds we use for sort of signal improvement sort of operations, but in terms of pavement preservation types of things, uh, those day-to-day -day maintenance activities. Um, the Dr. Cog directed funds generally are not available for those types of projects. They're available for capital improvement projects and um, some reconstruction in some cases, right? So really we're talking about the local funds that, and RTD funds and CDOT directed funds that go to maintaining and operating the system. And ultimately those all of those revenues that are expended on those types of categories will be reflected in the 2050 RTP, just as they're reflected in the 2040 plan. The focus of this presentation, this discussion today, really is more of the capital investment part of, of the financial plan. And I guess one point is the decision for Dr. Cog not to use maintenance funding isn't necessarily a federal eligibility issue, but a Dr. Cog board decided policy, correct? 
I think that's actually not not exactly correct, Brian. Um, the the federal funding categories that are available to Dr. Cog to direct um, are generally not available for maintenance activities. You can't just go and do um, uh, repaving on a facility with the Dr. Cog directed funds that we get. But you can use it for reconstruction, correct? Can, you can use them for a full reconstruction activity, but not for sort of paving or filling potholes, that type of stuff, that, that, that not, basic maintenance activity. And I'm not looking at that issue. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Did you have any further questions, Brian? No, I don't, okay. not at this not? time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Melinda, any other hands raised? Uh, yes, we do. Our next question or comment is from uh, Megan Davis. So Megan, let me go ahead and unmute you. All right, and you should be able to speak. You just need to unmute yourself. Thanks, this is Megan Davis with the city of Louisville. Um, I guess first in response to the questions, I would I would just echo some of the comments that, that Deborah had made. I think that, um, that staff and through this whole process has done a really good job of identifying kind of the, the policy priorities and um, creating this approach that really reflects what our um, our priority our, our policy priorities are into the future. So appreciate that. And I just had um, sort of a, a maybe a mechanic, mechanics question about the interplay between the funding categories that are laid out um, in the financial section that we were looking at previously um and the the tip cycles and and the new kind of sub-regional process that provides a little bit more flexibility around sub-regional funding and how it's envisioned that um you know how these kind of interplay together and how it's envisioned that the tip funding fits in here is that all a part of the tip set aside um or is it to be spread out among these categories and then each community will sort of determine how their projects fit into those categories. Yeah, so Megan, that's a really good question. Uh, let me try and answer it and provide some clarity around that issue. So back on the slide again, there's I think at least three things I wanna say. The first thing is that the reference to the TIP set-asides you know, can be a little bit confusing. So let me clarify, the point of having the TIP set-asides here and the four set-asides that we have is to just make the point more from a policy perspective that you know, look, the things that we fund in the TIP set aside, the things that you all worked on together for the 2020 to 23 TIP, those things are important and we want to carry those priorities forward. So in our TIP set asides, you know, regional transportation, uh, technology and operations, human service, uh, community, um, community mobility planning and implementation, um, and TDM. I think I have all four. Those, those things are very important to this region. Those are things that we want to carry forward through the RTP. So that's really sort of the reference there. It's not so much about you know, the TIP versus a non-TIP. It's a point that these are things we're already funding through our TIP. We wanna to continue to fund these things through, um, through the 2050 plan. The second point I'll make is that really the relationship between these two sort of at that sort of highest philosophical level is that the long range plan, and this goes back to federal requirements, the long range plan really sets the vision um, and really sets the template for the region in terms of the types of things that we care about and the major projects that, that we think this region is gonna invest in over, um, over the next 30 years in this case in the 2050 plan. For major capital projects, so not everything, but for major capital projects, it is a federal requirement that those projects be contained in, in this case, the 2050 plan to make them eligible uh, to compete for funding in a TIP cycle. So again, that, that gets back to that philosophical relationship. The plan sets the vision and the TIP is one of the important things that helps implement the plan. So what we're reflecting here is simply what is that big picture vision? What are the important things that we want to invest in? Some of these are projects, you know, major capital projects that we'll show um, with a line on the map or a dot on the map. Some of them are more programmatic, um, but again, these are the major sort of policy oriented things that we think are important that we want to invest in through the 2050 plan. It will be up to future tip cycles to uh, to help implement some of these things. And then the third point I'd make in terms of that direct relationship between the plan and the TIP, the 2020 to 23 TIP that you all worked on and recently adopted is essentially the first four years of the 2050 plan. Does that help? 
Uh, yeah, it does. I appreciate that that clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Are there uh, any additional speakers? Uh, yes, thank you. We do have another uh, question or comment from Mac Callison. So, Mac, go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, Matt Callison, uh, Rappo County, City of Aurora. Uh, uh, Jacob and, and Ron, a question in terms of on attachment six, where you, you're listing in, in outline fashion uh, some programs and, and categories, actually. How would you um, elaborate on those responding to uh, developing the Metroplex to be more comp economically competitive? uh and sustainability uh notions of within the inner mountain west and particularly within the metroplex uh, a, a follow-up also in terms of certainly with covid 19 we've seen the importance of logistics distribution uh and uh and certainly freight movement and goods delivery i really think it would be important to uh, have a strong representation of how that is directly recognized in in the in the program. Uh, and then a, a third notion is how I think it would be important for attachment six to represent the place and 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 consideration of the 136 projects that were submitted. That that category of of need. How is that represented in, in attachment six? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mac. Um, so let me start to tackle those three questions and I will ask for help from Ron and Alvin. Um, on your second point on the freight in particular, um, and again, a couple others of you have raised this, so I do want to assure you that when we bring the full financial plan forward, um, you will see that category for freight. And I think just seeing that, um, will help um, that piece of the conversation. We've heard you um, in terms of that importance. It's an importance, um, you know, it's a point of emphasis for us as well. Uh, so when we bring you the final financial plan, we'll make sure uh, that the financial plan kind of reflects that. Um, Matt, going to your first question about the Metroplex, I'd actually ask for a clarification unless Ron thinks he can answer it based on your question. But can you clarify for me kind of what you're getting at specifically with the Metroplex? Well, well, certainly from an economic uh, base and, and development perspective, we have certain areas. Uh, for uh, for this discussion, let's let's bring out the Aerotropolis area. Okay, uh, certainly it's an area of statewide significance, and certainly uh, a regional wide significance in terms of economic development and continued uh, uh, growth and sustainability uh, on that. So, and and I'm sure there there are other Carters and and nodes or areas, if you will, subdistricts uh, that are uh, distributed throughout the throughout the metroplex. So we're talking about uh, you know billions of dollars of investment, and how on the on the development side is this are those investments complementary to and supportive of continued economic based development. Well, that's a good question. Uh, Ron, can I actually lean on you? Do you have any thoughts? <laughs> well, um, I, I think, Mac, we've, we've talked about freight. Um, Metrovision plan has, you know, some significant objectives and um, goals around sustaining economic development and um, allowing businesses and people to thrive, which it really is, is about economic development and economic opportunity um, through, throughout the region. And, you know, freight, Freight and good movement can be part of that. It's not the only aspect of, of a competitive economy and, ec and economic opportunities for businesses and people in the region, but is, is certainly reflected in our goals and in the objectives. And so as we as we look at specific project investment priorities, that's a that's a consideration and was part of sort of the evaluation of specific projects that were brought forward uh, from local sponsors through the subregions and something we will consider uh, with our partners as we continue to refine this programmatic level of investments to um, specifying um, individual projects 
that will, will, will also be listed specifically in the plan. You know, one one note, and in, in certainly not on a project by project basis, but but certainly programmatically, um, one could start to look at uh, an an all encompassing return on investment uh, metric or metrics uh, on that, and and the value uh, delivered and the and the outcome realized. So, um, yeah, I did, more, more I discussion. Was... It's it's complex, but. Uh, yeah. I just feel that uh, it, it's something we might want to look at. So, yeah, understood. And I, I, I would, I would say it's, it's evaluated and looked at as part of the overall um, program and how we will, how we're evaluating sort of different investment options with the limited funds that we have relative to the region's needs. Which, you know, there's a big funding gap, and J Jacob sort of alluded to that early on in the presentation about, you know. How much should we um, explore and include in the financial plan for this RTP some additional regional revenue to invest since there's you know a significant gap between the six point three billion dollars worth of priority requests that we received from local partners and the what couple of billion dollars of Dr. Cog directed funds that are actually in, available to invest in those projects over the next thirty years. Right. A, a, a quick follow-up on on those on those categories or the anticipated uh, funding levels, uh, uh, Ron or Jacob, uh, is it uh, a, a somewhat typically what we've seen in the past uh, in the past iterations? Is it more an aggressive that we that additional sources of funding uh, and and would be coming online? Uh, a number of in a number of cycles between now and 2050. How how would you characterize what that uh, what those sums are and and the ability for those to be higher in the future uh, or less? Um, yeah, thanks, would... Mac. Let me let me try and respond to that. Um, so a couple things here. Um, first of all, and I can bring up attachment five and six if necessary, but just sort of the global point, uh, recognizing there's a little bit of confusion between the two. Um, they will eventually sort of become the financial plan. We're showing you sort of distinct pieces of the financial plan. So attachment five is really, really sort of that next cut of the overall financial plan, but really focusing on kind of the revenues coming um, to the three regional agencies in terms of what revenues do we have available to play with uh, to start putting, you know, a 2050 plan together. Attachment six is really about um, this proposed sort of program investment strategy, the things we've been talking about the last half hour, the BRT network, uh, regional vision zero, you know, some of those sorts of things. So we wanted to show that in a little bit of detail. The big picture answer to Max's question is that when we worked with our partners, particularly with CDOT, um, in terms of future financial forecasts, uh, what CDOT calls program distribution, we did collectively and we coordinated throughout the state of the five MPOs in the state. It's something that we all do jointly together. We did, um, and this was about a good year ago or more, um, we did collectively determine together that we wanted to assume the highest so we did different scenarios of, of future financial forecasts and we ended up adopting or approving kind of the highest kind of financial scenario. Obviously, this is well before COVID, but the point there was that we wanted to take the most, I won't say aggressive, but assertive stance on future revenues that might be sort of available to us. And that is being built into the financial plan, as well as the question we've asked all of you is, you know, hey, should we assume even a little bit more additional sort of regional funding um, potentially to bring to the table over the next 30 years to include the financial plan? So in that sense, I would say the financial plan is, is assertive, if not aggressive. However, I'd also say that, um, you know, there are some financial realities and I don't want to pick on our partners at RTD, but we all know they've got some real financial realities. Hopefully over 30 years of this plan, that sort of stabilizes out. Uh, we've got COVID that we're dealing with, at least in the short term. We're trying to think longer term, even with an assertive financial plan. However, you know, again, the level of investment that's been sort of potential investment that's been asked of us through this process, the 6.2 billion or whatever it is, um, you know, we do have a gap that we need to close there, um, and that's what we're working on in the interagency process. We have several times the amount of um, requested sort of projects or candidate projects than we do available funding to fund them. That said, I do want to make clear that if you look at the history of our long-range transportation plan over time, 
when there's been, you know, after we adopt a long range plan and, and let's take a particular project, not one in particular, but just think about a specific project, when that project has been able to, you know, bring some funding to the table or, or things have changed, circumstances have changed around that project, you know, to the point where a project sponsor would say, hey, can we, can we amend this into the long range transportation plan? So here I will pick on a project. Think of the I-25 gap project. That project wasn't in the 2040 plan that we adopted in 2017. Um, but through the hard work of CDOT and, and local governments and others, you know, money came to that project. We amended it into the plan. So my point here is that, yeah, we have a huge gap to close. I'm not going to lie to folks. We've got several times the number of projects that we're going to be able to fund. That's what we're working on in the interagency process. But by the same token, when money is able to come to a project through other means, you know, the question is, well, can I get it in the plan later? Typically, we've been able to do that. If there's funding associated with a project, you know, we can typically find a way to include it. Okay. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Ron. Melinda, are there any other uh, uh, hands raised? Uh, yes, uh, we don't have any new hands raised, but uh, a few people who have already spoken and have some additional questions or comments. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with Eileen Yazi first. Eileen, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, thanks again for entertaining my questions. Um, I think I, I just want to um, say, going back to the, and I and I am going to go back there, about freight. I'm going to say the, the freight word again. Um, I am a little confused how, like in October, like attachment five and or six would change that would acknowledge the regional investment or nod to freight. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so let's really think about sort of attachment five. Attachment five and six are kind of two parts of an overall whole. We're showing you two slices of the pie today that we wanted to focus your attention on. When we bring you the whole pie, um, the entire 2050 financial plan is going to include attachment five and attachment six and many other things. Um, and if I need to, I can bring up the 2040 financial plan, but I don't want to because we're going to show it a different way for 2050. So I don't want to confuse people even more. But I think the larger point that I'd make is that, again, the financial plan for the final 2050 uh, regional transportation plan is a financial plan that recognizes all of the revenues and all of the expenditures that go into maintaining and updating and improving um, our region's multimodal transportation system. So there are a lot of categories that deal with things like freight, things like asset management, um, you know, local, local sidewalks was something we had there in the past. I mean, there's a whole range of categories um, you know, the local government investment in local streets, that's something that we have to at least estimate. Um, toll highway authorities, you know, we have to we have to include that as well. So, you know, et cetera, et cetera. My point is that there's a whole bunch of things that will be included in the in the final financial plan. One piece of input direction that I'm taking away from today's conversation is that let's be intentional and let's be clear in the final financial plan about our strategy on freight. And we will do that. Eileen, Eileen, this is Ron. I'll, I'll supplement that just a little bit by saying that, you know, most, many, many specific projects have multiple benefits, right? And, and many of the projects that will be um, included in the financial constraint plan as specific investments um, will have freight benefits as well. And uh, as I, as I said to Mac, you know, economic vitality, Economic opportunity in the region is an important consideration of um, deciding what what projects to invest limited resources in. Um, it's not the only factor; it's it's one of many factors, but it's certainly an important one, and it, especially in light of kind of the the issues that the region and the country are facing today. Um, so that is that will be considered. It is being considered as we figure out sort of specific projects from those that were submitted to include or not in the financially constrained plan. Um, I think we historically have not had a specific sort of freight set aside program in the TIP, for instance. So that's part of the reason you're not seeing a specific freight category here. What you're seeing is um, some specific programs that we're proposing because of the way they can help move the needle in some really important objectives that we have around safety and air quality and the environment. Um, and um, reducing VMT. So that's sort of why you're seeing a new safety program 
um, kind of multimodal programs, or BRT programs specifically proposed here. Freight tends to be more about specific projects, so we're considering that as we evaluate specific projects to include in the financial constraint. Okay. Um, the other thing, um, or a couple other things, is um, I, I think like looking forward, and maybe it would be helpful, um, you know, again looking ahead in October and November as as this plan keeps progressing, and so does the uh, financial plan is, is it possible to kind of do like a, an example of what this means from a five-year perspective? And I think that goes back with um, everyone, like this is, you know, when you say 30 years, it's just kind of a big blob a little bit that is floating around. But I think sometimes seeing like a five-year, like what does this mean to a couple of people's points earlier, what does this mean from a shift perspective? What would what would five years look like within this this type of of programmatic framework? I think that actually would be helpful, not only from the technical you know advisory committee here, the, the transportation advisory committee, but even possibly for um, uh, our our leaders that sit on the boards. It, it could be kind of again a, a simpler thing to see that shift. Um, and then also, I, I think an area too, and this echoes some of the comments earlier about maintenance. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of Denver specifically on this one. We have some significant bridge infrastructure um, that is related to our, you know, transportation system and our network in in Metro Denver, and that supports um, the regional and statewide activity. Um, and that we're in some dire straits, I think, with some of our bridges, our viaducts, and our major infrastructure. And I'm just wondering, is you know, while while we'll continue to work with CDOT on the bridge enterprise um, funding is is kind of and it's and I know it's just nearly impossible to split hairs with with uh, the limited amount of funding we have to meet all of our needs. But I just want to make I want to I want to ask if bridges and or kind of that maintenance area will be recognized from a local perspective rather than a CDOT perspective. Um, I'll let Jacob Thanks, cover the second. I'll let Jacob cover the second question. Um, the first question I think I can hit on if you just um, give me a little bit of the gist again, because I got wrapped up in your maintenance question about bridges. Whoops, I oh, think you're sorry. I sorry. I sorry. Lost my train of thought there, Eileen. Um, I think the five year snap, it's a really good suggestion on the snapshot and sort yeah. of the, the change. I think yeah. five years would be challenging just because we just adopted a four-year tip last okay. year. Got and it. so the 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 first four years, essentially the first four years of this plan is already committed with investment, you know, $350 million of Dr. Cog directed investment over the next four years is already basically spoken for. So I think, but it's a really good idea. And I, I will take that back and have a conversation about maybe the first 10 years of the plan would be maybe that. I think yeah, there you go. Just something, yeah, just that. just something to kind of yeah. what a lot of us have said, like, what does that look and feel like from yeah. that shift perspective is how much of an investment are we shifting or what does that look like and things like that. I think just to get a that um, almost that tangible um, sense. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Yeah, and what I'll say, I'll actually supplement Ron's answer in this case that um, one of the things, again, it's a federal requirement, we do it anyway, but one of the things that we're going to do sort of at a global level in the 2050 plan is through the overall financial plan, we do want to show some increments over time that it's not just, you know, 30 years of, of numbers or calculations. We will show um, at least at a, at a broad level and as specific as we can, but at least at a broad level, kind of those 10 and five year increments in part. And here's where the federal requirement comes in is the notion that, you know, I've talked about fiscal constraint. That's one of our biggest federal requirements. It's not just over the 30 years of the plan, although that's the biggest part of it. It's over time. You know, we all know that our revenues and expenditures, sort of the rate of change of our revenues, you know, how, how quickly our revenues are growing, how quickly our costs are growing, those can vary over a 30 year period. And so we do want to do a kind of midpoint look of, you know, are we staying on track in terms of fiscal constraint over the course of the plan? Um, so we will, we were going to do that anyway, but we'll take your suggestion back, Eileen, and, and kind of supplement that. On the maintenance question, um, I think the short answer there is yes. Um, the overall financial plan doesn't just include maintenance from a single agency perspective, so not just CDOT, not even just RTD, but we do at least attempt to 
again, it's a 30 year broad brush plan level. Um, it's not a four year tip, but we will attempt to um, have a sense of overall globally, what do our maintenance needs look like through the course of the 30 year plan? Thank you. Melinda, are there others with hands raised? Uh, yes, we do have another hand raised from Art Griffith. So Art, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. It's, um, so I guess it's attachment six, which it has the amounts on it. Um, and I'm wondering, um, given the unknowns over a 30 year period, does it make sense to take the tip set asides and merge them with regional BRT and vision zero to allow more flexibility in the future over this 30 year period? Yeah, that's an interesting idea, Art. I guess what I'd say for the purposes of this meeting, we just wanted to be hopefully as clear as possible in terms of showing you the different types of things that we're proposing to invest in. So to call them tip set asides was really just sort of a logistical, mechanical way to reference some of those current investments. When we put the final financial plan together, the final 2050 MVRTP together, there probably is some room for maneuverability in terms of how do we show these things, but we wanted to show you sort of the constituent pieces today to be really clear about where they're coming from. So we're we don't really need to tie those to money amounts. Um, we could just leave those categories then at this. Are we looking for an approval today? <laughs> no, we're not looking for an approval today, no. Okay. Um, so for example, the tip set asides that we're showing the attachment six, again, those could change over time. The names could change, the focus could change a little bit. We're using that as a, again, logistical convenience because you all are familiar with them because they're part of the current tip and for the most part have been part of recent tips. That doesn't mean we have to show them that way in the 2050 plan. We don't have to have a line item that says, you know, continuation of tip set-asides for 30 years per se. And, and that's what I'm getting at. There's some flexibility in terms of how we roll this all up together. At the end of the day, what our federal requirement is, and I think what our regional requirement is, is to be clear and intentional about what types of major things are we investing in? What are the dollars associated with that? And how does that how does that work its way through a 30 year financial plan? And, and Art, I would just say, you know, we couldn't come up with a good reason why we would necessarily sort of change these categories of the current tip set asides. And the rest of the program stuff sort of builds on those and is, is in addition to those. But we couldn't come up with good reasons to that we would that we would suggest sort of significant changes to sort of the the last couple of tip cycles, major tip set aside. So why would we, you know, human service transportation is a growing need in the region. Uh, the population is getting older. There's a growing need for those types of investments. We couldn't come up with a good reason why we would stop investing a certain amount of money in supplementing human service transportation. Um, same for regional RTO and T, regional transportation operations technology. The, Op optimizing the operation of the signal system can, will continue to be a significant priority in the region. The specifics on what those monies get, fun, you know, get invested in might change over over the course of a few tip cycles, but you know that's going to continue to be a, a priority investment in our mind. Um, reducing travel demand through the TDM program. So we just couldn't come up with a good reason to justify sort of significant changes to those tip set asides. And as Jacob said, the the specific purpose or you know there might be some refinement to that through the next uh, couple of tip cycles but again we we revisit and amend these things um, on a cyclical basis so this is our best guess at a 30-year vision now and we'll revisit in a few years well um ron i i like your your response um that it it almost sounds like you know tying the amount down is you know like doesn't let like the tip sets aside address for mon more funding for addressing the senior needs and uh, and others so um so if we're gonna i wasn't sure why we're showing money on those but i guess it's just a glimpse for us to 
this discussion. But yeah, um, and we have to account. We have to account how we're going to spend the expected resources that we have over the next thirty years. Yeah. But I, I think that the three that I was merging together, and you know, that's like you know, one point six or one point seven billion on how you round. Um, and that's a good chunk of our percentage. But to put a four hundred on one limit that or BRT close to 900 million and then set aside 377. It just didn't seem like it's giving you guys flex, giving us all flexibility to increase one of those more than ever and still live within the total amount. Yeah, I think the, the, the points well taken, that is a balancing act and appreciate that feedback as we sort of refine this over the next couple of weeks, but it's a, it's a really good point. There is some, there is some balance there, right? There's, there's and there's advantages to being really flexible, but we may not be able to sort of produce the kind of plan that we should produce for the region if we're too flexible. At the same time, we nece we don't necessarily want to tie our hands too much and and take away some flexibility where it makes sense. So finding that right balance is the trick. I, I guess since we're not all together, it's hard to you know read people's body language to see if they kind of uh, concur on adding a little more flexibility or making it more rigorous or leaving it the way it is. But I'll throw that out to the chair if he wants to entertain thoughts from others. And I'll, I'll be done, thank you. Um, Melinda, before we move on, are there other hands raised on this subject? Uh, there is another hand question. raised um, from Brian Weimer. Um, so, Brian, you can okay. go ahead and yourself. Thank you. Um, based on the programs that you've identified, I'm curious where um, congestion management, um, maybe capacity, fits into the overall plan. And does that fall into multimodal being all modes, or what is your thoughts on that? Because I don't see that being addressed, and that's probably an issue that um, it, it looms um, dooming in this region. And yeah, there's various ways of addressing it, but I think um, that might be one of the tools that isn't being included. Brian, I think oh. that falls into the second question of which we can segue right into. Um, thank you. Um, in addition to the evaluation panel's guide and what else should the region agency consider? And I think that's that's a question there. Falls into that one. So go ahead, Jacob or Ron. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. So uh, the way I'd answer that, I appreciate the question, Brian. Um, again, today we're having a conversation about some programmatic things, recognizing that we're still working on kind of punching through the 137 candidate projects that we received. So, and that's coming later in October. But I think the larger point I'd make is that, you know, capacity congestion, that's certainly important um, as well. And I don't want to suggest that it's not. Um, you know, we historically in this region had an all of the above type of strategy. Um, I think in this plan, we are sort of being intentional about emphasis on certain things that we haven't emphasized as much in the past. Um, but, you know, all types of things are on the table here, including, you know, things like capacity and congestion management and those sorts of things. So I think what I'd suggest is that as we work through 137 candidate projects, that that's a big part of that piece of it as well. There will be capacity projects in the plan. Hopefully these projects, as you've directed us and others have, have given their input, that they will be multimodal. They'll be, you know, sort of triple bottom line. There'll be things that can do you know, sort of serve multiple purposes at once. But, it, you know, if the question is around capacity in particular, you're going to see that when we bring forward uh, the fiscally constrained project investment priorities. Brian, did that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's moving on to the second question. In addition to evaluations, panel guidance, uh, what else should be the regional agencies consider? Are there uh, um, any hands up to discuss that, Melinda? Uh, thank you. Give everyone just a moment. 
Okay, I do not see any hands raised for this. And Mr. Chair, if I may, I will suggest that um, this has been a really good conversation. Don't want to cut anyone off, but I think we've sort of blended into the second and third question. So we're the questions here were just a device to get the conversation going. Um, the conversation's been definitely going. Um, so I think we've started to touch on all three. We'll certainly take any additional input on any of these, but we'll take all of this back. And we okay. really appreciate the feedback. Yeah. And then you had a question on the financial part of it. Yeah, that was the other sort of informal thing that I added to our list, yeah, which is, um, you know, sort of consideration of a regional uh, funding source to supplement the financial plan, um, you know, for 2015. Um, I think <laughs> I would guess that most folks are in favor of that. If anyone's opposed, we'd be interested in hearing that, but um, wanted to put that on the table as well. Uh, be interesting to hear from anyone that would be opposed to that. Uh, raise your hand. And we'll give you a minute or so here. Um, right. Jacob, do you see that being like starting 10 years out or something just for conservative on that regional funding? Yeah, I'd say probably so, Mr. Chair. I mean, there's some there's some timing and sort of strategic considerations there, you know, given that we, as I've said, um, the 2023 TIP is the first four years of this plan. You know, we've got some near-term projects. We've got a TIP cycle coming up within a year and a half that we'll be working on. So I think that is our initial thought that this, you know, supplemental funding source, let's call it a potential sort of additional regional funding, would be something that by the time it gets up and going, those revenues flow to projects would be something that'd be a little bit later in our 30-year plan cycle. Okay. So were there any hands raised? I'm not seeing any hands, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. With that, then um, we'll conclude. Thank you, Jacob and Ron, for your and and uh, everybody for your participation on this. Uh, we're now move into other member comments and um, other matters. And um, Carson, if you could give us an update on the AMP working group update, appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The AMP Working Group met earlier in September, I guess, last month to discuss some next steps for a report that was put together on the priority tactical actions that was given to the Executive Committee of AMP um, last month. So that, that report stemmed out of the work um, from the focus area subcommittees that included topics on data and data sharing, shared mobility, and system operations. So continuing our work there in those subcommittees at the meeting, uh, the group also heard some informational briefings regarding the electric electrification efforts at CDOT from Mike King and an autonomous transit connections project presentation from Easy Mile. Uh, we have another meeting tomorrow, and that is all I have for today, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Carson. Um, I believe, Jacob, you had one uh, heads up announcement uh, that you wanted to make. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this relates to air quality conformity for the 2015 uh, Regional Transportation Plan. Um, so I've been scripted, so I say this correctly. Um, as part of the 2015 VRTP, Dr. Cog must continue to demonstrate conformity to the region's air quality state implementation and maintenance plans uh, for ozone, carbon monoxide, and something that we call PM10, which is particulate matter 10 microns or less. In order to continue to meet our PM10 budget, Dr. Cog is once again asking local governments and state agencies to commit to road sand reductions and street sweeping actions. It's through these commitments that Dr. Cog has been able to demonstrate that the PM10 air quality standard will not be violated in the future. So the heads up really is just in the coming weeks, Dr. Cog will be reaching out to your roadway maintenance departments seeking a continuation of those commitments for PM10. So we just wanted to let folks know. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there other matters that need to come before the TAC today that have not, uh, that the members have, TAC members have? If so, Mr. raise your Mr. hand. Chair, this is Ron. I just, I do, I wanna say thank you to CDOT staff in particular that participated in the meeting today. It is a state holiday for them. And so um, some of our, some of our partners, and I know they're probably not the only ones, some of our local partners as well, kind of chose to use some of their holiday time to join us on TAC and just really appreciate it. And sorry for the, Sorry for the change in schedule for those of us that did not anticipate, did not realize that the state had changed the state holiday from next Monday to today. 
Yes, thank you for those that had a holiday today to participate. Uh, are there any hands raised, Melinda? At uh, this time, I am not seeing any hands raised. Okay, our next meeting is October 26th, uh, 2020. And at uh, 3.39, uh, declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you.